go to the sea and then parted the waters and then all the fish no water die there then you can just pick up the fish right many many ways for this um, miracle to have happened but I think that the real miracle is that Jesus wanted the people to become the miracle by taking part in the miracle Jesus wanted the people to become the miracle by taking part in the miracle last year um, how many of you have been to FCC last year and been to the new building so you know when when we were beginning to putting the plans together for the, the new building project um, I have a cell group in Hong Kong and I moved back from Hong Kong um, in June last year and one of my cell group members his name is Ernest he told me this during cell group um, he's got a Catholic background and he told me during cell group Gary I have a word from you from God I'm like and if you know Ernest, right, Catholic, you know, very traditional and all that, and he says something like that, it's some completely out of character. So I went to, uh, so I asked him, because I trust him and been in a relationship for, with him for a long, long time, so I asked him, what does God want to say to me? And he said uh, to me, if you want the people to see the hand of God, you have to allow them to participate in the work of God. If you want the people to see the hand of God, you have to allow them to participate in the work of God. And at that time, we were just getting ready to move forward with the plans for the building. And honestly, I wanted it to be very, very efficient because I got no time to deal with people. And people take a lot of time to deal with. What I wanted to do was assemble a very small team. We make all the decisions, work as efficiently as possible, gao team the whole place, then just move the church over, na tada, your home. And then Ernest spoke to me and said, God wants to tell you this. If people are going to see the hand of God, they have, you have to let them participate in the work of God. You are literally robbing them from your, their blessing and not letting them become part of the miracle because you are doing everything yourself. So you can see the miracle and nobody else sees the miracle that's happening. And so what we did was this. I repented. I created, I worked with the, the, the project leads and said to create 26 different work streams. Everybody had to work on a different area. Some people work on you know, what the welcome area is going to look like. Some people look at what the kitchen is going to, the, what, how the kitchen is going to function in, in, in their related area of ministry. Some people look at the pastor's office. Different people look at 26 different areas of church life. And all the church got involved to dream about how they saw this as their home. And then in June, we put up the place and put the plans into action and collected all of that and I can tell you that it has been a miracle because there is no church that looks like that there's no church that operates like that there's no church that feels like that and it's far beyond what if we had done it with a small team that we could have done ourselves and because it was also so many people that were invested in it guess what people started giving towards their own vision that they had created and when people started giving towards their own vision guess what where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And they became even more invested in the church. And they saw themselves as a part of the life and ministry of the church. And then the church grew in the process. And so, you know, we today get to enjoy the miracle and see the miracle of what God has done. I know we had uh, we've got a membership of 110 people in FCC officially. A, a few more people than that come for services regularly, and we were able to put up a building that cost us five million ringgit of 110 people. That is the power of what a miracle looks like. And for those of you who came there, you you were completely in awe about what God has done, and we are still also continually in awe about what God does and continues to do in and through the lives of people who are willing to be part of the miracle. So then, I want you to also remember that every one of us is an ordinary person. And as I introduced myself earlier, it's not about our trying, but it's being able to be connected to what God, a very extraordinary God, wants to do in and through our lives individually our lives in this community and the lives of the church and if we plug ourselves into that you will see that everything that you can think of or imagine or ask God will go beyond and that is a promise and we've seen it time and time again in the feeding of the 5,000 and in so many areas of life 
And so if you want to see the hand of God in your life today, you need to participate in the work of God. And so Jesus asked you and I the question, how much bread do you have? And it's up to us whether we want to respond to that. But if we respond to that, we get to see God at work. Number three, so first one I talked about, I get to see, I get to reflect God's generosity. Second one, I get to see God at work. And thirdly, I get to create community. I get to create community. GSKL is a community of faith, right? And true community, what the word community means is that it allows us to bring our whole selves, our authentic selves into relationship with one another. No um, facades, no masks. You can take off your mask. That's what true community is supposed to look like. And God calls us into relationship to one another so that we can grow with one another, support one another, encourage one another, admonish one another, you know, hold one another accountable, lift one another up so that we all grow together as a church and become a blessing to the world. That's the point of the of community. And one of the foundational principles of community is sharing. One of the foundational principles of community is sharing. You know, in this story, you saw the what happened was that when Jesus asked the disciples, how much bread do you have? They went to go and look around themselves and we were like, that's all we have, we've got not enough. We only got five loaves and two fish. How to, to feed so many people, you tell me. And some of the interpreters of this um, scripture, when they went on to read this, suggest this. It suggests that what Jesus did was very, very significant by lifting up the bread that was given and breaking it and then giving it out. Because what this has done is that some interpreters suggested that the bread and the fish did not magically uh, multiply as Jesus was breaking it. In fact, what had happened was that by Jesus showing what had happened, taking what little that they had, breaking it and sharing it, it could change an attitude within the crowd out there. And so those people who were in the crowd, maybe they had brought a, a piece of bread in their thing. Maybe of them, some of them packed a whole lunch. Maybe of them had a clay pot inside their, inside their <laughs> robes. But what happened was that in the end, they saw what Jesus did and they themselves changed their attitude instead of like holding on to what little I've got. They took out what they have and then they shared it with one another. And so they changed the mindset and changed the culture and be able to then give it out. And in so doing, they found out what? That when people stopped hoarding and started sharing, that there was enough and more than enough. So when Jesus asked the disciples, how much bread do you have? He's also asking us today, how much bread do you have to share? with other the people around you? Are you going to hoard your resources that God has placed into your hands for yourself? Or are you going to create a community where every single need around you, you can just offer what you've got? Because they are going to offer what they have got to you as well. And it's going to be more than enough. So when we see uh, in this particular culture, in the get to give culture, it's about number one, we get to reflect the generosity of God. Number two, we get to see God at work. And number three, we get to create community. Now all of that takes a step of faith. But the fourth one, in fact, is something that I want to just spend a little bit of time on. And I'm, I'm going to close with this. I get to release happiness. I get to release happiness. And this one is kind of important because there is a, a, a point and a, there is a something in it for us for in, in this whole thing. Last week, I watched this, uh, this documentary because I just ran out of things to watch. So I went onto my Apple TV uh, playlist and on iTunes and I was looking for something to watch. And I came across this documentary called Happy. Has anybody watched this documentary before? It's a very interesting uh, documentary. It's a, um, it's a study on happiness. And so these are, uh, it's a relatively new area of psychology, uh, uh, a new area of science called uh, the, the study of happiness. And the reason why it became a new area of, of interest is because happiness is a universal desire. Everybody desires to be happy. 
No, I mean, some different places um, uh, call it different things. You know, in Christianity, we, maybe we call it joy. Because happy maybe is a bit more emotional. You can't always be happy. But you can always have the, you know, that sense of joy that's within you, right? Not everything is going to go your way. And it's going to be a bit loopy. If you, every moment of the day, you're kind of like tripping and like, ah, oh, that's right, that's right, right? But every, when, when people went around and asked, you know, why do you do what you do? It's for, for most people, their answer is because I want to be happy. I earn enough money, I go out and work, I work so hard, it's because I want to be happy. I want to be able to buy the things and have a life that I can be happy about. So the, 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 the money is not the point. The result is the point is, the, is that people want to be happy. And the interesting thing is that what they then do when they went on to do is that this group of uh, researchers, they got a film crew, went with them and, uh, and then went to do some research about what makes people happy. What makes people happy? And the thing about it is that if finances makes people happy, money makes people happy, then the richest people should be the happiest people, right? Correct? Logical, right? More money means more happy, right? So, the country that has got the most amount of money is which country? Overall, most amount of money, highest GDP. China. China. Highest GDP country is still USA, China number two. Okay. So USA has got the highest number of, uh, the highest overall GDP. And when they went to the USA and then they ranked, you know, they stack ranked it as a, the UN did this particular study called the World Happiness Survey. And you can go and download it, it's a free thing from the UN website. It looks at 128 points, that's a lot of surveys of people. The US ranked 23rd in the survey. So the nation with the highest GDP overall ranked 23rd. So obviously, you know, doesn't mean more money equals happier. Then they went on and said, maybe we got this research done wrongly. What about the highest amount of money per person? Because you know, maybe you US a lot of people, you know, very big population per person. So the country with the highest GDP per person is which country? Anybody can make a guess? Singapore, I wish. Uh. <laughs> it's Qatar. A lot of oil money, uh, right? Lot of so the smallest population, lots of revenue, greatest GDP. So are these people the happiest people in the world? Actually, they rank 27. And Singapore is not bad, you know, in terms of per capita GDP. You know, we have quite a lot of money per person, but we rank 40 on the World Happiness Index. Hong Kong is even higher in terms of their per capita GDP. They rank 64th in the World Happiness Index. So obviously, something is not right. The thing that we are pursuing all our lives is not the thing that's going to bring us happiness. You know, of course, not having money is going to make you very unhappy. But not having more money is going to make you happier. You see the, 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 the logic here We're from the study. So the question then is, what is it globally that brings about happiness. So they went out all over the world to try and find, you know, what is the, the thing about, what is the thing that brings happiness? And they found something very interesting. It is biological. Okay, so the thing that makes us feel happy is this hormone in our brain called dopamine. Dopamine. And it's when you are happy, this, you are happy because this chemical gets released in your brain and you have that, that happiness, okay? So those monks, right, who sit around the whole day and meditate, what they're trying to do is try to release that chemical into their brain as much as possible. So they, they did that, they, they put the monk under the, the MRI scanner and they measured the amount of dopamine that's in the, the, med, the, the person's brain when they go and meditate. And then they found that as they went into this deep meditation, they were able to flood their brain with this chemical. So they're very at peace and very, you know, zen and very happy at being in that, in that moment. Not all of us have got that discipline to be able to flood our brains with dopamine. So they actually looked at what are the various elements that are actually going to create dopamine. And I can tell you that there are, uh, the, the first um, thing that I want to, to mention about this is that Dopamine, unfortunately, is 50% um, biological. 50% biological. So if you are 
um, naturally sad person, you know, it means that naturally you have just less dopamine in your system. And then necessarily so nothing you can do about it. It's biological. They found out then that, so 50% is biological, but what about the other 50%? They found that 10% is circumstantial. 10% is circumstantial, meaning that if you go through a very lousy time, Versus that you're having the, you know, the, uh, a, a very bad situation going on in your life versus a good situation that's going on in your life, the circumstances that's coming around your life, that only forms 10% of the, the dopamine levels in your brain. So in other words, it's not circumstances that is actually causing whether you're happy or not happy. Then what is the balance of the 40%? And they found that the balance of the 40% is actually intentional actions intentional actions, which means these are things that we can do for ourselves to make ourselves happy. So bio biology, you can't do anything about it. Circumstances, you can't do anything about it. But 40% of the amount of dopamine that you have is based on your own control, actions that you can do. So monks meditate, but the, there are actually three elements that create the most amount of dopamine in people's systems. The first, um, thing, and this thing is not working, so I need you to help me advance the, the uh, slide. The first thing is called flow. Flow. So, the, it, this happens when you, know, when you see athletes, right, who are doing their competing or doing something that they really love, they have got this uh, thing that they are in the zone, in the moment. And when they're in the moment, they are releasing a lot of dopamine. That's so why there are a lot of these people, they are called like, adrenaline junkies and people like extreme sports. Because they are, when they are doing that, they are releasing tons of, of, of dopamine because they are happy moment, you know. That's why people, that's why when you exercise sometimes and um, you, it, you, are, you are naturally releasing dopamine. But not everybody has the opportunity to, you know, get to these moments where they actually find the thing that, that makes them happy. Because when they're not doing the thing that makes them happy, then suddenly there is no dopamine being released. The thing that find, where the people find that generates flow the best, you can do it in everyday life, is collaboration. Not competition, collaboration. So it means that if you're working together to a common objective, and you're building something together and for the common purpose, it releases a ton of dopamine. You get into the flow state. So the first one is collaboration. The second element that generates a ton of dopamine is, please help me move forward. Oh, I can do it myself, okay. It's compassion, it's compassion. When we're acting co compassionately, when we're being a blessing to, uh, to other people, when you're being generous, you're releasing a ton of dopamine. Generosity is to materialism the way kryptonite is to Superman. You give of your finances, your ability, your time to, to meet the, people, the needs of the people around you and ironically you're being blessed back at the same time with the one thing that everybody is looking for which is happiness. Very ironic, that's our wiring. That's how we are wired. When you act compassionately, you feel good about yourself because you're releasing a ton of dopamine. And the third thing is that is community. It's community. Community, the happiest countries in the world in the survey, right? Uh, the top five are all Scandinavian countries or Northern European countries. The number one happiest country in the world are the people in Denmark. They're the happiest country in the world. You want to be happy, you go to Denmark. And so they were asking themselves, why are the, the, the um, people in Denmark so happy? So they went to go and study them like you know, all researchers do, and they found out a few things. One is there are a few things that are in place. They've got a good GDP, means people got enough money, but they didn't have a lot of money. They have got free education, free healthcare, low corruption, all of these things were in place. Okay? They also pay, by the way, more than 50% in taxes. But they're the happiest people on the planet. So what is the thing that's making them so happy? So they found that overwhelmingly, there were three differences in the, you know, the Danish people versus everybody else around them. Three big things that make them stand out. The first thing that made them stand out is this real sense of social support. Second thing that really stood out is the freedom to be able to make life choices. They're a very progressive country. You want to do what, you can do what. 
that you can make any sort of life choices, nobody's going to look down on you. You want to make a career out of road sweeping, nobody's going to, to say anything. They've got freedom of life choices. And the third one, they have a culture of generosity. These are the three things that makes the Danes so different. The social support, the freedom to make life choices, and the culture of generosity. And one of the very distinct things about the Danish people is that if you go outside of the, the main city, you see that people don't live alone. They live in these things called communes. So up to 20 families will rent one giant warehouse and then they break it up into individual units and then they all move in together in that, that place and the people live there together in, you know, as teams of families or communes. And what happens is that the way that they operate is that the uh, 20 families, every time they will take turns <coughs> to cook for one another. <coughs> so rather than every night I have got to cook for my kids, they all cook one time for the whole 20 families. So they take turns to do, to do that. They also look after one another's kids. If you want person to go out, say, you know, look after my kids already, your kids come over, you know. And they have that real sense of social support. They do life together. And that is one very, very interesting distinctiveness about the, when they were interviewed, how happy they were in those particular situations to be able to go through life together with the culture that they have built. And it was, it's completely intentional. And because of that, they're now the happiest country in the world. And if you then remember um, what was written in the early church, and I'm going to, this is the last passage of scripture we're going to look at, it's from Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. And this is about how as disciples we are called to be intentional in these actions that we are, that we are taking, in the building of this culture. And here we see just like how we are building a community here, the believers back then in the early church, this was the first church, that they were, be, were building a community. So keep in mind all these elements of happiness uh, that I've been talking about. Keep in mind this thing about the culture of being able to get to give as we read through this passage of scripture. This is the early church. This was the first time the church came together. And this is what the church looked like. And it says here, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Note, they didn't say that. They saw God perform many miraculous signs and wonders. God worked through people, the apostles, right? It says here that the apostles themselves were the cause, and they were the ones who actually created the miracle happening. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And because they were enjoying the goodwill of all people, each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. So all the elements that we talked about about being happy is there. You see? Collaboration, compassion, community. No wonder they were so happy. And no wonder that they grew. Because it was what people were looking for. They were blessed to be a blessing, which resulted in their own blessing. And it's really incredible when you see this. And when you think about what the church should be, I've got a new kind of like um, um, thing that I put together here based on this. And I want to share it with you. So what is a church? I really think that the church, and from this understanding and this reading of scripture, is a countercultural because we are saying we are changing the way that we are looking at how to do life, about what it means to give. The church is a countercultural community of Christians who are collaborating compassionately. The church is a countercultural community of Christians collaborating compassionately. So countercultural meaning that we're not here because we got to give. We're not here to give so that we can get. 
We're not here because we are grudging to give, but we're here to create a culture that we get to give. We get the opportunity to give, we get the resources to give, we get the, you know, all the things that we talked about. And we believe that the thing that is going to mark how far GSKL goes as a church and our effectiveness as a church depends on the culture that we create in this church. What is the culture that we create in this church? In all areas, including our finances, the way that we manage ourselves and our time, relationally, our talents and abilities. You know, I, get, I got at 5 a.m. to come to church this morning because I came from Singapore. But I am super happy to be here because I am operating in my gifts, talents and abilities. I get this opportunity to get to give. I am flooding with dopamine and not, no one can take that away from me. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so Jesus asks you the same question that he asks me, the same question he asks the disciples every day. How much bread do you have in your hands? Are we going to be a God to give kind of church? Are we going to be a gift to get kind of church? Are we going to be a grudging to give kind of church? Or are we going to uh, be a get to give kind of church? I really believe that I want this church to be marked by our love and by our giving. And there's going to be a church that reflects that generosity of who God is. And I believe that if we focus on becoming a community that collaborates compassionately, I know we'll be all be blessed by the very one thing that we all seek. So that's the message for today. And that's the message that I have for this church. Right up at the top, as we begin 2015, let's build a culture that is a get to give culture here in all areas of our lives. And we believe that we want to be different from the world. Let's not bring the junk of the world into the church, but let's transform our lives in this church by the renewing of our minds and the way that we live out that. I really believe that as you do this, you will be blessed because it is been, it's in the wiring. The research proves it, the science proves it, the theology proves it, the history proves it. But it's just so radically different from what we are being, the, the stuff that has been inflicted upon us. So let us pray, and I'm going to pray that God gives us the ability to take this courage, to renew our minds, and to take the step of faith forward to be able to become a radically generous community. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for GSKL. We thank you for the witness that this church is today. And Lord, I pray that as we enter 2015, Lord, that you're going to be building up a people that will become radically generous, Lord. We pray that we're not going to be a church that is got to give and we're compelled and feel pressure to give here of our time, of our energy, of our finances. We're not a church here, Lord, that gives with the objective of making this as an investment to get back money, Lord. We're not a church that is grudging to give because we're so worried about what we're going to have left at the end and whether there's going to be enough time, enough energy, enough resources to do all things we want to do in our lives, Lord. Even though we know that giving is a sacrifice, Lord, we know that you have wired us in a way that the one thing that we all seek universally, universally is the one thing that we can intentionally do, Lord, and that is to live out a culture of generosity to be able to have live out the culture of getting the ability to give. And Lord, I pray that th today that this message will take root in my heart and the hearts of every single person in this church, Lord. That we will be known and be marked by our generosity and our love for people around us, Lord. That we'll be generous not just in our finances, but in all areas of life, Lord. That we will share what we have got because we are blessed to be a blessing and in return, Lord, you have promised that we too will be immeasurably blessed with the one thing that we see that money cannot buy, Lord. So Lord, I just pray a spirit of encouragement over this place, Lord, that you would just help us to step out of our comfort zones, Lord, and take you at your word and your promise. Help us to be able to see your heart in the pages of scripture today. And Lord, I pray that as people give of their time, their energy, their finances to the work that you are doing,